Good afternoon. It's 2014, and we'll look back at this as an extremely important time, focusing on the potential of precision medicine. The idea that an individual is going to be treated for their disease rather than a disease. Elimination of treatment for so many people and a solution for so many others. And that is the promise of the 21st century. That is the promise of our commitment that we've made over the last particularly 20 years to sequence the genome. Today we have four individuals joining us today. Uh, on my far left, we're going to also go by first names, uh, Pradeep, uh, Chris, um, Governor. <laughs> oh. That's not my first name yet. <laughs> there was a fellow who was a state senator, and after he was retired, he changed his first name to Senator. He did. It. <laughs> and uh, Jeff. And so we have on my far right here, Jeff Bloodstone from UCSF, Governor Jerry Brown. Uh, on my left, Chris Austin who heads the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, and our honored member from the University of California, San Diego, uh, who was previously at Carnegie Mellon for a number of decades uh, before he came out to serve as chancellor at what is now a center of the most number of biotech companies in any one part of our country, and that is in the greater San Diego area. But I think one of the keys we'd like to start with, Jeff, if you would start us off, is what is precision medicine? Yeah. Great, sure. Well, if we could just throw up uh, slide 11 for a second. I thought it'd be good to, to maybe spend a second on what the problem statement is, and then I'll tell you how precision medicine would hopefully change that. So, so here, here's the problem. The problem is, is that today, our disease classification is really predominantly based on symptoms and organs, not, not function. Take an example, I work in diabetes. Um, we know someone has diabetes because their blood sugar is high. The thing that leads to that, the mechanisms, we don't diagnose the disease based on, which means that one disease, diabetes, is likely to have many, many different um, causes. The second problem is that we have not taken a disease agnostic approach so that we don't really, since we don't understand the molecular underpinnings, we don't know what mechanism is involved in one disease that might also be true of another disease. So the drugs we develop don't often get utilized, and Chris may talk about this later, in diseases that we wouldn't have anticipated they would work. And that's because our research is siloized often, our educational system is siloized, and so treatment ends up being very expensive. We don't treat the right patient at the right time with the right drug, and I think everybody in this room is aware of that. So one more slide, slide 12. So the concept of precision medicine is really a concept like Google Maps, where not only do we understand the data that's needed to define the symptoms of disease, perhaps the roads that you're all driving around out when you want to go from point A to point B, but layered upon that should be all this other data, big data, big information, the environment, the, the, the social elements of your lifestyle, the, um, the microbiome, the bacteria that, that are in your gut. And so we think of precision medicine like a very effective Google map, where if you could accumulate enough information and put it together in new ways, you could build a much more ro robust mechanistic understanding of disease. So on the, on the, if you can click this thing, you'll end up instead, on the next slide, it's sort of a, it's a next slide, is the same kind of layers in medicine where epidemiology, environment, microbiome, metabolome would all come together across different layers. And at the end, you would take this massive data network, aggregate it, integrate it, and come up with an underpinning of disease that would then be more precise, it would be more personalized, it would be preventive, and it would be less expensive. Thank you, Jeff. And I, and I think we should step back and fully understand, if we look at slide 50, just how large an investment and how long it took. Uh, the sequencing of the human genome, led by Francis Collins at the time, who heads the 
National Institutes of, of Health today, project 13 years and actually $3.8 billion invested to sequence the first human genome. <coughs> today, we're approaching $1,000 and takes a few hours. And with modern technology moving ahead here, we're going to eventually be talking about a few hundred dollars and you know, who knows, 10 to 15 minutes. It gives us the power to do things. And if we go to slide 45, you can see here this power allows us to enter a new golden age of medicine. And whether we call Aryan precision medicine or immunology or stem cells, this dramatically changes the future for all of us today. And um, about a year, a little more than a year and a half ago, with Leader Cantor work in the House and the Leader of the Senate, Harry Reid, and the President signing the law, an entity was formed called the National Center for Advancing Translational Research. And uh, Chris Austin, who has been with us for a number of years at the Global Conference, is the first head of that center. Margaret Anderson, the executive director of Faster Cure, serves on a review board for that center. But Chris, let's talk about why this was such an important undertaking by our country and hope what are the citizens of this country and, and actually of the world going to get as a benefit from this, the fact that this came to be? Well, first I want to thank Mike and Faster Cures for their leadership in helping um, uh, make the case that <clears throat> NCATS was, uh, was to be formed. The, the, the process of translation, um, I think, is poorly understood, and that's part of the problem. Translation is a bit of a term of art. It simply means the process by which an observation, which happens in the laboratory by a scientist or an individual doctor in a clinic, which gives a clue about an intervention, a new drug, a new diagnostic, a new behavioral intervention, the process by which that observation is converted to a systematic uh, intervention which is shown to improve human health. Um, this is a, a, an enormously uh, rich problem, which uh, we, uh, we're very inefficient at doing currently. Um, just to give you one number, or I'll give you two numbers. Um, the process currently of going from a discovery in the lab uh, to a new drug currently takes about 15 years, costs between about two and $10 billion, depending on how you do the math, and fails 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, and, and this is limiting uh, the, the, um, the, the potential that the amazing discoveries in science, such as the Genome Project, uh, uh, limiting the, the realization of that potential for, improve, for improvements in human health. I'll give you one other number. Um, there are about 7,000 diseases or so that affect the human family. Uh, currently, there are about a th treatments for about 1,000 of those. Um, I did a calculation a couple of years ago of how many, how many diseases are going from the untreatable to the treatable category. That's about three a year. That, that means at the current rate, it will be 2,000 years before every disease which affects the human family is treatable. And I would submit to you that that is an unacceptable answer, and it's unnecessary. But it's, not, it's only going to, to change if we study this process of translation as a scientific problem and an organizational problem uh, and approach it in a, in a different way, in, this, in the way that you were just hearing Jeff talk about. Uh, if you go back to the last slide uh, that he showed, it's a great example. Um, I don't know if you can go back to that. But if you, if you look at, uh, instead of looking across, if you look up and down, that's how scientists, science is typically done. NIH has actually 27 different institutes, and they're organized by organ system or disease. So there's a heart institute, and a cancer institute, and an eye institute, and a nose institute, and a skin institute, and a kidney institute, et cetera. Uh, but, but, but what we've discovered through the Genome Project uh, and other uh, remarkable advances in the last 10 or 15 years is, is what our mothers told us is true, that the knee bone really is connected to the leg bone. And if we approach the problem in this way, we will make discoveries which we never knew possible. So I'll give you one example. Uh, in a, in a, uh, we at NCATS have put together a complete, complete collection of every drug ever approved for human use worldwide in the history of medicine. It's an unprecedented collection. And, and in the first time we ever used that was to study a particularly untreatable form of leukemia. And what came out of that was a drug that had only previously been used for rheumatoid arthritis. 
No one would ever have thought of using this rheumatoid arthritis drug to treat leukemia, but it was only because of this knee bone is connected to the leg bone um, uh, approach of this type that, leg that, that Jeff was talking about that we could go from that discovery to a clinical trial in people in less than a year. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to make happen so that patients get more treatments more, more quickly uh, and, and with more, more precision of the sort that you'll hear about. You know, as we step back and think about this enormous commitment that was made, if we look at slide 52, for example, other countries, not just the United States today, have uh, really focused on this effort and realizing that those countries that are going to be the future uh, leaders in the world in relationship with the other countries in the world, it's really going to be based on bioscience in this century. And, and it's not just um, medicine. It's agricultural, it's air quality, it's water, it's defense, it's energy. And if we just take a look at the amounts that are being committed, if we run back to that last slide again, we could see here that on slide 52 that the amount that's being committed by these different countries, 1.9 trillion, okay, 1.9 trillion China is willing to commit. And why are they committing this? Because of the enormous challenges that lie in front of them. Uh, Singapore, a country with a population less than 1 50th of the United States, committing almost 40% of the equivalent of the National Institute of Health budget. And so these changes that have been occurring throughout the world, as each country, one by one, many of them who are represented at this global conference, have made this decision. If we take a look, say, at, pay, at number 54, it sets the stage uh, of what's going on every minute. What is going on every minute? Four million Google searches a minute. Two million four hundred and sixty thousand new Facebook postings a minute. And so as we interact today in a world where there are more mobile devices than people on the planet, if we go to 55, you can just see what the potential is in this area. In 2010, 17% of cell phone users used their phones to look up health information. By two years later, 31% looked up health information. And it is projected uh, that those 44 million healthcare app downloads of 2012 by 16 are going to grow to 140. 142 million healthcare app downloads. So it's not just the speed of technology that's available, it's the ability to interact with individuals that's available to us today going forward. Pradeep, let's talk about the potential from precision science. Maybe you could identify you know, some areas that you see applications. The people you know, in the audience with us today and are watching this around the world uh, who might not have MDs or PhDs. Right. Okay, How, what does this mean for them? So let me families? start by first talking about, in all of this, I think our universities and research institutes are gonna play a tremendous role because without them, we could not get to where we wanna be in precision medicine. So let's go to slide seven. I think when it comes to universities, the first thing we need to do is fundamentally rethink how we operate and we need to start in my mind, vertically integrating uh, discovery with engineering and big data and with prevention and therapy. So going from bench side to bedside, and we should be vertically integrated in that area. This, by the way, is a simple concept, but it is an extremely foreign concept to most universities because, God forbid, the biologists have to work with the chemists, have to work with the doctors, have to work with the neurologists, right? But this is where I think we are headed, and this is where we should be headed. Now, if you then think about the range of diseases that uh, Chris talked about and that Michael has alluded to, uh, clearly cancer is one of the diseases where uh, this would have, uh, uh, precision medicine would have a big impact. But let me tell you something that 
we all kind of live with, but don't quite understand how to live with, and it impacts every one of us, uh, every family, and that's mental diseases of various types. Schizophrenia, depression, I can just go down the list. Any type of mental disorder, there's hardly a family in this country, in this room, that has not been impacted. It is a silent killer of families and family life. And I think that has, and that's, mental disorders are the ones I think we understand the least about. We understand what depression is based on symptoms that you come and tell me, the doctor. By the way, I'm not a doctor, I'm a computer scientist. But we need to get down to the level of understanding neurons and circuits and understanding the brain and understanding the activity, just like we do in cancer, molecular activity that causes depression. Why do some drugs work on some classes of people and not other classes of people? I think that is, a big impact that is ready to be made, a new class of industry that can be generated right here in California and also make a very big impact on mankind in general if we can conquer mental disorder. I think you've really made an important point, Pradeep, and that is when we put out the report at the Milken Institute, led by Ross Duvall and his team, on an unhealthy America in 2007, one of the things that was shocking to me was not just that it was costing the United States $1 trillion a year and the change of weight between 1991 and 2007 from absenteeism, presenteeism, and out-of-pocket costs. But the thing that really struck me is when you factored all those in, the number one cost was depression. Mm -hmm. It wasn't cancer, it wasn't diabetes. The number one cost was depression when you factored in absenteeism and presenteeism. So I think uh, before we go to Governor Brown, maybe showing you a specific example of the potential of precision medicine related to what had been always a disease that took your life, cystic fibrosis. And so what we have in front of us is the fact that many drugs and many things in this 15-year journey that Chris talked about were not approved. They didn't make it through phase two or they didn't make it through phase three. They might have only affected three or four percent of the people positively. It didn't have a positive effect for the majority of people. It might have even had a negative effect for some others. And so the question was, with the ability to sequence the genome, can we find mutations or combinations in an individual who had a positive response? And so over the last four or five years, we are now reopening, with the support of disease-specific organizations, reopening and often putting up the money, in this case the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, to reopen these trials and find, okay, this group had a positive response. How are they different from the others? And this is our promise. This is a look at something that started with a sequencing from Francis Collins that went eventually to a biotech company who then financed this trial uh, by the cystic fibrosis and today is a drug available and you'll see the results of that drug. My name is Stephanie Dosnick, and I'm the mother of two children with cystic fibrosis. Keith is a freshman in high school. When he was diagnosed, they told us his life expectancy was about 18. So the current life expectancy is about 37, which is a pretty amazing advance in the, in the 14 years that Keith has been around. I am doing the best machine to break up the mucus inside of my lungs. I have to do it twice in it for 20 minutes a day. To have two siblings have cystic fibrosis is not very common. My little sister really looks up to me and when she sees me do my treatment, she wants to do hers too because she wants to follow my footsteps. I started Kaleidico, within four days, I stopped and took a deep breath in and I wasn't coughing and I could actually breathe. I kind of opened my eyes to a future. I mean, I've never let anything stop me in the past. 
now I'm thinking, oh man, I'm gonna be old and I'm gonna have gray hair. And that's what I talk about all the time. My dream is for patients to be adults and grandparents and great grandparents and have gray hair. And I know that's, that is a fact now, it's gonna happen. I know other patients with CF are gonna have uh, more endless opportunities because of this drug. If I could have one wish, my wish would be to have cure versus safe fibrosis. So I don't have to do my treatment machine anymore. Not have to carry around a bunch of pills. I think everyone should be excited about Kaleidico. I mean, we know that it works and we know what it does. It treats the underlying cause of cystic fibrosis. It's opening the doors for other, other drugs that will treat the other mutations for everyone else with cystic fibrosis. So we're there and we're on target. We know how to do this. So just uh, remain hopeful and excited because we, uh, we're close. So today, a Pfizer drug that was not approved, um, cystic fibrosis has put up the money, $59 million to reopen those trials to go through, sequence the DNA, look at what was in common, was there anything in common that those that had a positive response had versus those that did not have responses or had negative responses. And if that search turns up a pattern among those, then Pfizer has agreed to finance the rest of the trials and the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation will share in the revenue. But I think this, in many ways, we always assumed that there would be one thing that treats everyone. But we're all so unique, and whether it's the alt mutations in lung cancer, this is a specific example where we can look at the data and find out what drugs work for what individuals. Now, when we step back and look at the role of California and just how important a role it plays, let's take a look at uh, slide 70, for example. And here gives you a look at, from a technology standpoint, um, R&D expenditures on a per capita basis, and we see that California is low. But if we move back two slides from there uh, to slide 70, need to go back a couple slides if we could, you'll see here that what a hub California is for technology. It hosts eight of the 10 most profitable technology companies in the United States. It is the home to the leading social media companies. And not only that, on some measurements, it has six of the 20 leading bioscience universities in the world, and by some other measurements, four, but more than any other state. And outside of the United States and the UK, more than any other country. And if we looked at slide 71, you can just get a feel in the, in the state of California of the most profitable technology companies in the United States and where they're located at this time. And one of the key elements uh, on this chart tells us that the potential of consolidating our university's efforts with the for-profit technology companies to really focus more on bioscience and what might happen in that area. So Governor Brown, you bring probably the greatest perspective maybe of any governor in the history uh, of our country. Uh, this year, the election this year for governor will be 40 years after your successful election in 1974. Uh, what is your perspective? I know you've been doing a lot of studying in this area today and, and as you think back to the 1970s or 80s or other periods of time in our state's history. Uh, what is your thought about science and the potential, particularly in the field of bioscience today? Well, just looking at that, I think Apple didn't start to the early 70s, so I was already elected to my first statewide office in 1970 before Apple started going uh, with the Apple II or the Apple I. Um, Qualcomm, I don't think, really got going till the early 80s. And then, of course, uh, 
Facebook and Google are, are even more recent. So uh, the first obvious point is in the space of 40 years, uh, incredible changes. And uh, what is impacting so much of our life and our economy uh, wasn't even conceived of uh, not that many years ago. So California, in a very uh, unique way, is a state of imagination. It is the place of uh, conceiving what hasn't been conceived before, because we are an open society. We, through the immigration, through the research, through the entrepreneurs, through the cultural pioneers and innovators, uh, lots of stuff happens, and uh, it's a porous kind of political and economic culture, and the result is uh, these very innovative industries. Just, but it doesn't stop, by the way. Uh, this quarter, first quarter, 2014, 60% of the venture capital investment in America happened in California. Now, what does that say? That says that uh, people who are investing in startup companies and new ideas, these are smart people who have a lot of money and are putting it to work. But what are they doing with it? They're giving it to other smart people. <coughs> I recall talking to an individual up at uh, Palo Alto one evening at, a, at an event, and I said, uh, what are you doing? He said, well, I've started three companies. And uh, I said, well, don't you find the regulations and the taxes and the red tape? He said, no, what I find here in Silicon Valley, I find the smartest people with money and those smartest people are giving that money to other smart people. Mm -hmm. And the combination of those two uh, is why I formed three companies and why they've been successful. So this um, uh, concept of precision medicine, this reality, is another example of a leading edge uh, human <coughs> endeavor. And California, uh, it's not the only place of leading edge endeavors, but it's certainly uh, one of the most predominant, if not the most predominant, in the United States. So, yes, we have a great opportunity here, uh, and uh, I think that's the, you know, it wasn't too many years ago that people used to call me Governor Moonbeam, and one, there are a lot of reasons for that, by the way. It's not just one thing. <laughs> I earned that for a number of <laughs> accomplishments. Or, uh, <laughs> but one of them was when I proposed in 1978 the state purchase the SYNCOM-4 satellite, which NASA was going to sell us for $5 million. Now, Proposition 13 came along, and we had to contract and, and cancel some of these spending ideas. But a satellite of that quality today would cost the state hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, this is the time where we have to keep that momentum going with investing uh, in new ideas, in new projects, and uh, new research uh, capabilities uh, in our universities, as well as what people are doing in private business. So it, it is very exciting, and uh, I think about that as I uh, look toward a possible fourth term. That you know, you hang around too long, you just have the same old, uh, old, same old ideas. But in California, you know, even the old guys can be pretty creative because of the, just the spirit of the place. And I just want to tell you, Mike, bringing all these people together, I mean, this is pretty amazing. And I think uh, we ought to feel very proud and excited about not only what the state has done, but what the state can continue to do. We are the eighth largest um, nation in the world, if we were a nation. And, you know, if the Congress wanted to take that step, I'd certainly accept it. Uh, but we are a $2 trillion economy. There's only seven other countries uh, more powerful in terms of economics. So we can do stuff, and we have the people, and the venture capitalists have voted again this quarter that California is the predominant uh, source of uh, fundable ideas in the whole country probably the world for that matter. I think if we pulled up slide 26, you'd see kind of a reinforcement of what the governor's been saying. And we just look at the top performing metropolitan areas in the United States, for example, in the biotech index, and you'll see that six of the top 12 are located here in California. And obviously this breaks up San Jose, San Francisco, and Oakland into three areas. And in honor of Pradeep, obviously, San Diego. 
being number one from this standpoint. Jeff, if UCSF is home to one of the largest and most comprehensive stem cell efforts uh, and centers in the world, help us maybe connect the dots between the research being done there in this area and what might be done with the expansion of precision medicine. What does that mean? Yeah. So I think that stem cell, what, what happened in the stem cell area is very similar to what we're talking about here. Um, the stem cell effort was not about a single disease or about a single approach. It was about a platform technology that would transform um, health and medicine across the whole spectrum. And, and why did it do that? Because it's, it, it started out with you need to train the best people in the world. And so the stem cell program, when it was first initiated, the CIRM had training programs to bring people from around the world and train them. Secondly, it had provided the tools and technologies. So partnering with industries, creating industries in California to be able to um, develop the cells, grow the cells, use the cells as target for new drug development. Um, so it created that set of tools that were necessary. And then the third thing it did was to partner with industries who were willing to now take the chance of using that technology to create new drugs. At a time in which cell therapy, and even today, cell therapy isn't necessarily considered to be a typical pharmaceutical drug. You don't put it into a bottle. So those three elements, I think, are brought together in the precision medicine world as well. There'll be a set of platform technologies using big data. There'll be partnerships with industries that never partnered before in the ways they will now, digital industries, computer industries, aerospace industries, to use that kind of algorithms that are needed to bring data together in, in unique ways. And then there'll be an educational opportunity to train the, train the next generation of physicians, scientists, nurses, other practitioners, and citizens who are gonna be taking together, taking this in, on their own to do it. And I'll give you just one small example, because not all of precision medicine is really expensive, which is what I sometimes hear. Our head of the Department of Urology, a prostate cancer doc, does a lot of surgery on patients, and is always worried about what happens when those patients leave the hospital. How are they doing? So he now hands out to each of, the, each of those individuals Fitbits, you know, those little um, bracelets that can monitor how many steps you do a day. And he monitors how many steps his patients take a day after the surgery. And if he doesn't see them taking a lot of steps, he gives them a call and say, how are you feeling and doing? There aren't a lot of technologies that we need to impact on our lives of our patients. And so these are the kinds of things that these platforms like stem cell like precision medicine will do to change the lives of a lot of people. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Chris, um, we all focus on potential for collaboration. In the medical area, you know, we constantly hear about potential conflicts between for-profit, non-profit. Um, let's talk about the potential for collaboration in this area with NCATS, with industry, research institutes, academic centers, patient groups, and other stack mm -hmm. stakeholders. How do you see that, and how will that accelerate this period of time you've spoken about? Yeah. Um, well, let me start with an aphorism from, um, <clears throat> from a German pathologist in the 1900s, Herner Wolrath, who uh, said one of my favorite uh, sayings. He said, um, much is known, but unfortunately in different heads. And, and that is still true. And so uh, in, in the translational space, it's particularly true because translation, as I often say, is an obligatorily team sport. It doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter how, how well-trained you are, it is impossible for any individual researcher to take a project all the way from an idea in the laboratory uh, to a demonstration of public health benefit. And so NCATS was started with um, at least two um, uh, core values, those are demonstrably useful deliverables, and by useful, I mean to patients, useful. And, and secondly, collaboration. <clears throat> so every project NCATS does is a collaboration of some sort or another, and uh, we actually have a, a fairly large effort in technology development or paradigm development on novel collaborative uh, um, uh, paradigms. Uh, and those are with patient advocacy groups, with uh, biotech, with pharma, 
um, uh, of course, with our, our traditional colleagues in academia, uh, with regulatory agencies, we have many very rich collaborations with the FDA, starting to do those with, with CMS. Uh, and, and what we find is that, that, like playing football, if you get 11 players on the field who each know their position, but they are all trying to score a goal together, uh, those goals are, are often uh, much more achievable than you would, uh, might otherwise think. So I'll give you one example, uh, which will, uh, um, I think, get us back to the precision uh, medicine issue particularly. So one of the problems in developing new therapeutics is unanticipated toxicology. So uh, before I came to uh, NIH, I was at Merck, and uh, Merck made a drug that you may have heard of that had trouble in this uh, direction. It was called Vioxx. Uh, and, uh, but, but the fact is that about 30% of drugs um, uh, that are in development fail uh, because of unanticipated toxicity. Now, how is toxicological testing traditionally done? It's traditionally done in animals. And, and what NCATS is doing is not only moving uh, that testing uh, uh, conceptually from uh, animals, rats mainly, to humans, which uh, we hope will give us some greater precision, um, but also to moving these uh, to uh, high-tech organoids. These are little, uh, about one millimeter squared um, uh, multicellular aggregates of cells made mainly from induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, which are on microfluidic platforms. Uh, it's a combination of, one, of amazing engineering microfluidic technology, uh, the kind of stem cell technology that you've heard about, uh, biosensor technology, which comes out of, uh, uh, out of uh, both the computer and the biotech industries, uh, and tissue printing technologies. Um, and the, the promise of this is not only that, that, uh, that, that toxicity testing will be more uh, uh, um, more predictable because we'll be using human tissues instead of animals. But now take this one step further. Uh, let's say this is a, a, com a new compound for, um, for a disease, let's say, all five of us had. We wouldn't have to take a, 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 a generic cell from someone in the population. We could make a tissue chip that represented those organs from Jeff and Jerry and Mike and me and, and Pradeep all at once and make our own chips and test that drug in vitro in this chip uh, before we were given it um, to potentially be able to both predict whether those drugs are going to be work, work or not uh, and also to avoid uh, side effects. Now, this would be a, an absolutely transformational change in the way medicines are, are, um, are developed and used. And, and the point that I think all of us want you to take away from uh, is that, that this is not science fiction. It's happening, this, this, this kind of technology development is happening right now uh, um, uh, in many places in, in uh, California and otherwise. I think one of the keys here is just the development and the deployment of technology. Right. And this issue of how do we speed this time frame, uh, Pradeep, I think there's a number of issues. One. What is the promise of big data? And I think we, maybe we should talk to people, what is big data? Yeah. Two, how does it interact with precision medicine? What does this maybe allow us to do to shorten this period of time between discovery and therapy that Chris has spoken about? Right, so big data is actually an overused term right now. It's basically, you showed a slide which talked about how much data are we generating every second, every day, right? Uh, what was it like? Uh, 1,000 or, oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, four, four million searches, Google searches every second. Every one of these searches creates data. So if you think about all of these things that we are doing, and if you think about this, all of this data stored in ones and zeros, and then you ask yourself the question, can I pose a question and search this database for that answer? And if the answer is yes, we have the methodology to store the data, we have the ability to uh, traverse the data, search the data, uh, learn over the data, argue over the data, and figure out what the answer is. That's what the power of big data is. Now, when it comes to precision medicine, let's go to slide eight. I think it captures a lot of very interesting concepts. <clears throat> so the first concept you see out here is what I think of as a public-private partnership. I think going to precision medicine without a public-private partnership is not going to be easy. I don't think the government can fund everything, and I don't think the private individuals can fund everything. I think it has to be a partnership. So what do you see out here? You see UC San Diego, and you see the Craig Venter Institute, which is a private 501c3 
sitting on prime property of UC San Diego that we lease it for $1 a year. So Craig gets to build a super duper institute for literally no, land, no rent on prime property in, San Di in La Jolla, San Diego. Why did UC San Diego do it? Because we think this is a great thing. Craig is gonna invest hundreds of millions of dollars to bring great scientists out here. We have the PhD students, we have the faculty, we want the two to collaborate and uh, do research in ways that none of us can do one way or the other, that's number one. Secondly, you look at this, there's a whole lot of data being collected. So if you think about any patient uh, who's being <clears throat> looked at for any particular disease, uh, you're gonna be uh, collecting the proteomics on that patient, the metabolomics, the microbiome, the uh, genotypes, uh, the genetics, and so on and so forth. And all of this data has to be put in one single database, which is easier said than done. Multiple different representations, uh, inability to translate one representation into another right now. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But conceptually imagine you could do this, and now you can open this database up to really smart people in the world and let them, instead of doing wet experiments in uh, wet labs, they would be doing dry experiments, in this case, in the database, and trying to understand what types of molecules work on what types of circuits, uh, inhibit what, exhibit what, and I think this is the power of big data. Going like in 15, 20 years, I think this is gonna be a reality. Uh, and what uh, Chris was talking about in terms of this chip, uh, is just a step towards this point here because this chip, as it is being built and analyzing information, it's generating data. And as this data is being accumulated, it's, be it's becoming big data and our ability to search on this. So let me make one last point. If there's any state that is poised to get this right, it is this state. Michael showed six of the 12 top biotech regions in the, in the country are right here in this state. The IT industry is based right here in this state, and it's the convergence of IT and biosciences that's gonna get us to where we are. And I think we are absolutely well, well poised to do it right here in California. Roger. Michael, can I make just a sure. quick edit? The, the, the one part of big data that, that, that I don't want to get lost in this mm -hmm. is, is the data that we get from the patients and the environment and, the, and, the, and, and not the highly technical data. That's all key. But, when you put all, all the UC campuses together, there are 8 million to 12 million patients, which would be the largest healthcare system in the country. And the ability to harvest information. So for instance, I work, I'm an immunologist and I work in disease like asthma, where we now know based on socioeconomic, based on other sort of patient information, what kind of allergy, what kind of asthma these kids are getting, and that'll change how we treat them. So it's not just sequencing a million people. It's not just fancy machines. That's key. But it's also the information that each of us hold that precision medicine, the promise is taking that information as well and building it into the whole system. And Jeff, also the socioeconomic status. And socioeconomic, regions. Yeah. I mean, this very, the whole issue of health, public health and individual health is very complicated and intertwined. I think, you know, simply if we took just one disease category like prostate cancer, the idea that you treated everyone for prostate cancer the same doesn't make much sense when you know there's 28 types of prostate cancer, just like there's multiple types of breast cancer and so on. And part of our failure has been we've been treating it as if it was one. And this is one of the promises of precision science that we're going to treat you for your challenges. Governor, one of the things that we often think about is the privacy rules and bumping up of this data, et cetera, and how do we share this information most effectively uh, under existing patient privacy rules and questions like this, and it really it takes an interaction with government. So the HIPAA rules that restrict the sharing of information when we cure, let's say, cancer patients, more than 70% of them would be happy to make their data available if they thought it would help them or their family, and in many cases, someone else. How do you get these things through government? How, how do you interact through the regulatory system? You've been one of the most effective governors we've ever had in the history of our state, and you've somehow found a way to deal uh, with the legislature in both getting them to think long-term, not just short-term. Well, How would you all, approach it? 
Uh, well, first of all, California, even though it's big, 38, over 38 million people, it's still uh, fairly nimble compared to the federal government because anything that is a law, like the federal privacy rules on medical data, then it can't be changed if it is specifically set in statute unless the Congress has an enactment. So you gotta get through the Senate, the House, and the President. <coughs> Very cumbersome, and as everyone knows, it's quite dysfunctional back there because of the um, sharp uh, divergence of views between the two parties and even within the parties. So uh, I think like everything else, if people understand there's a value, uh, that value will become um, you know, respected and maximized. So if people can decide themselves to share, that may well be something you can do within the current uh, federal uh, privacy rules. So you just mentioned, you ask the people, they mark a box, and then the data can be shared. Uh, I was thinking as all this all this big data and everything is connected. Now, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, I guess. And, uh, uh, but when I hear that the universe is 97% uh, dark matter or dark, uh, dark uh, energy, uh, well, I think that's also true about government, by the way. 97% is below the surface and hard to figure it out. But there's so much to be known. And we're such, you know, just at the beginning of, of what, I mean, there's, it's inconceivable uh, how much further can, uh, we can go in terms of, of human health. And yes, uh, the technology is progressive, but government is regressive. And there's a reason for that. <clears throat> you can't be changing uh, the basic uh, constitution or rules by which we all live. So by the nature of, of things, the government is gonna lag and technology is, is, is the one leading because it affects only a small part, at least at the beginning, of the overall body politic. So how we change things, it's, it's one thing we invest in our universities, we develop new collaborations with the private sector, we have meetings such as this, and um, I think in California we're very open uh, to, to difference and to change. Uh, I mean, not that open because Part of life is tradition and continuity, uh, but the balance with change and continuity uh, needs to be right. And um, I think we've got a pretty good uh, relationship and balance between those two things, between keeping things the way they are and disrupting and breaking open and pioneering new stuff. So whether it's the federal privacy rules, um, I mean, I know that, the, Whatever they were, they were conceived, how long, how old is that? 20 years? That HIPAA thing, whatever it is, federal, must be. Longer. Well, 20 years ago, I don't even think they had the term big data. Or they didn't have the term precision medicine. So you have to make it, you have to change it, and boy, getting anything through Congress is not, I'm not an expert on that. I can tell you, we can get it through the state legislature to the extent that we're, um, uh, that we have the control, but the federal government, because of the rules, the money, um, it, it reaches into every, every nook and cranny of our social existence. So Chris, I think some of the people might be interested in, what is the background of an individual <clears throat> who today is responsible <clears throat> for the National Center for Advancing Translational Science? I think many people some of them know that you were thinking of being an opera singer, you were in music conservatory at the same time going to medical school. What was it that made you follow one path instead of another? Well, it, it, it actually segues well into the question of, of precision medicine. Um, and, and that is, my, my background is as a neurologist first. So I grew up um, in clinical medicine in the mid 80s, in the era of small data. Um, and, and you should know that doctors have been trying to do precision medicine since Galen. Um, uh, but what you I might want to tell them the date because maybe not everyone. Oh, uh, Galen was about 4,000 years ago. Um, <laughs> <coughs> sorry. Actually, I, more like 2,000. 2,000? Uh, He's a Greek. 
Is he? I believe or an Arab. I can't tell which one. But he was one of the. <laughs> yeah, it was more more than the more than the, the lifetime Galenic of. Galenic medicine has been rejected for hundreds of years. Yeah, more, more than the lifetime of. But it may uh, be coming back. Right. So, <laughs> so the, and and you think about what a what a doctor does. When you're talking about what? anything related to Greece, we have an expert. Oh, uh, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> well, I knew Brown was a Greek name. I, I wasn't... I, wasn't, I, wasn't. <laughs> I took Greek. I didn't take uh, calculus. <laughs> I didn't take trigonometry, but I did take two years of Greek and eight uh, years of Latin. Ah. And it does acquaint you with these um, fellows from antiquity. Yeah, right. So... <laughs> so, so so as a as a neurologist in the mid uh, '80s, um, it was a pretty dismal silence. Science uh, that is, if you think about the kinds of patients that one sees: Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, <laughs> multiple sclerosis, stroke, brain tumors, intractable pain. Uh, virtually none of them were treatable, and so um, I, like a lot of people, went um, uh, to genetics um, as a as a potential solution to that. And and one of the ideas at the <clears throat> time was if we understood the genetic basis of disease of, the, of these kinds of diseases, we would be able to diagnose them better and then treat them better. So if you think about your last um, uh, interaction with a doctor, uh, when you walked in the room, the yeah, immediately that right. doctor is thinking precision medicine. And, and no matter, even without big data, they're thinking, here's an undifferentiated person. I know nothing about this person. And from the moment you enter your, you open your mouth, they're, they're beginning to think, okay, this is a kidney disease or a heart disease or a brain disease. So they're, they're becoming, they're narrowing the diagnosis, right? Uh, and when you send out lab tests, you, you're, again, trying to become more and more precise in your diagnosis. Doctors in the mid-80s were well aware that with the amount of data that they had, large uh, uh, groups of patients who we were well aware responded differently to medicines and had different courses in their disease, even though they looked the same at the time, existed. However, we had no way of knowing what those differences were. And so imagine it's a, it's a sort of twilight zone experience where, where you're, you, you, instead of having a Google map uh, and being able to, 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 to know exactly where you're going, you land in a, in a neighborhood and, and, and all the houses look the same. And you know there are different people who live in those houses, uh, but there's no way for you to be able to differentiate all those different kinds of prostate cancer that we now know about. Uh, and so in the, the transition from small data to big data is in the same sort of uh, transition that's happened in so many other aspects of, of, of consumer goods. And I really think about medicine as a consumer good, that, that it, 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 it needs to be personalized. Uh, doctors have been trying to do this since the dawn of time, but they've never had the comprehensive data across the population and across uh, diseases to be able to do that kind of precision. And so now, when I look now almost 30 years later since I was in training, um, uh, the, the possibility of having one of those patients walk in the room and, and me being able to send out a genome sequence and within a week have back uh, uh, their, their entire genome complement and be able to make, in, in some cases, uh, not only a differentiation of the type of disease they have, such as in prostate cancer, uh, but, uh, but also the case in breast cancer and many other diseases, uh, but also have a, a treatment which, uh, which makes sense given the, the particular type of the disease that they have is quite, is quite remarkable. Uh, and and if, you, if you ask, well, where are we in, uh, in, the, in the development of this process? Are we at the beginning? Are we at the end? Uh, you, you all know that, that, that processes in, in life tend to, be, uh, tend to start out uh, with a relatively uh, a slow development, and then they reach an inflection point. And when they reach that inflection point, then process, progress happens very quickly at that point. And, and, and I believe the data tells us that we are right at that inflection point. And, and it, the, among other things, the things that I and others uh, think about on this panel uh, are that the, the inability to, to share data either uh, for technological reasons, like, uh, like we were hearing about, 
that uh, we don't have common uh, data platforms uh, to be able to share data. We have a VCR versus Betamax versus 100 other platforms problem uh, in, in uh, biomedical uh, data. But or, or voluntary um, uh, 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 rules that we have put on ourselves, such as HIPAA, could actually prevent this uh, inflection right. from happening. But I think it's our game to lose. I think we just need, as Mike was saying, we need to educate people about what the incredible opportunities are here uh, uh, to shift the balance from uh, perhaps overcaution uh, uh, to, um, to, to really uh, seizing the moment uh, and, and taking advantage of these. I, I want to ask you a question because you raised this point about um, privacy and data. Now, we we've all know about the flap with the NSA and the telephone yeah. numbers and the listening in. Yeah. Now, obviously, the more we know, the more connections we can make, right. or scientists can make. But that, well then why don't we just register everything about everybody yeah. from day one? And I think that right. will not be accepted. Right. So no, I think it's have you great... thought about where, oh, where we draw lines and how do we advance in science without having Big Brother have everyone yeah. coded in from the moment of conception. Well, why don't, why, don't we, why don't we give that assignment to Jeff here? Uh, and wrapping up here, Jeff, why don't we touch base on that one? And two, um, how is uh, precision <clears throat> medicine going to change the world? Now, if this was five or ten years from now, how is it going to change the world? Yeah. Only you ask me the easy, simple question. Uh, so, so to get to your question, which is, of course, a very difficult and, and, and challenging one, and one that always, uh, it, it's interesting to me because people are willing to give up lots of information to sign up to Facebook and yep. Google and things like that, but healthcare is different, and, and I think appropriately so, and we need to be very careful. I think the answer, in part, is to empower the citizen. Right. Empower the individual. That's Instead right. of the doctors saying, we want your data yeah. and we want it. If we can empower, and I remember Tom Daschle at a meeting I was at, held up his cell phone and said, I go to Mayo Clinic and I have all my information on here. And I can choose yeah. whether I want to give that information out. So I think the solution to your problem is empower the citizen, yeah. empower the individual to, to control their data. What do I think it's going to look like 10 or 15 years from now? It's hard to know, but I think that the biggest change is going to be that we are not going to be talking, it's the very first thing I said, we're not going to be talking about diseases from the symptoms of those diseases, but, but in fact the underlying cause. And diseases that we never knew were related are now going to be treated. You mentioned one example. We're doing a trial now in type 1 diabetes and autoimmune disease with a drug that's approved for cancer. And we wouldn't have been able to even think about that if we didn't understand the underlying commonality. So in 10 or 15 years, to me, the difference is you're going to go into a doctor's office and they're not going to tell you that you have cancer. They're going to tell you that you have a mutation or a change in a gene which might be responsible for your cancer, but it might also be responsible for your depression. And it might also be responsible. And that's going to change diagnosis. It's going to change how the, taxon the taxonomy of disease, what we call them. Um, and, and, and it's going to change the way we treat it because you're not going to be necessarily going to a specialist in cancer. You're going to go to a specialist in, in, in cilia or a specialist in some <laughs> other mechanistic pathway. Pradeep, let's, let's look at, you've got this phenomenal opportunity here with Scripps, Salk, Sanford Burnham, the Ventnor Institute surrounding and highly dependent on UC San Diego. You also, I noticed many years ago, we did this study showing that every time uh, someone won a Nobel Prize in Rochester, Minnesota, they moved to San Diego. So with the best weather in the continental United States, you have not only the science, right. but you have a place that people want to live. What can we see from your efforts and your collaborations looking out five or 10 years from today? I think you will see a couple of things. The first thing you will see is a way of collaborating on the Mesa, which is the plateau up there, uh, that would not happen in many cities. So if you look, take Boston for example, and look at all the great universities in Boston, they don't collaborate the way UCSD, Salk, Sanford Burnham, Scripps, 
all put their resources together, including our own libraries, including sharing PhD students, including sending our students to different labs and getting them trained. And this is unbelievable, and we want to make that stronger and stronger and stronger. Secondly, what I want to do is find a way to, to make the tech transfer process, because of these collaborations, become seamless and frictionless. So when institution A and B collaborate because of Baidol, you get to own your IP, I get to own my IP, and somehow in this field, everybody thinks one of two things. Either they're going to become, be a Nobel laureate or they become, they're going to become a zillionaire. And it turns out that 99.9% .9 people will be neither one, but they would have done great science and impacted humanity in a big way. And we need to put that in the minds of people to make sure that the, the discoveries we are making, the technologies we are developing, are being seamlessly transitioned and uh, really building companies and building great cures for humanity. Governor, um, I guess really the question is, if you look out at the potential end of your fourth term, when you get termed out here uh, in five years from now, uh, which will be 44 years after you started your first term. Um, first term as Secretary of State, 44 years. Oh, excuse oh, me. Oh, I guess 48 years. Yeah, 48 years. I'm losing track. Okay, what could, for the citizens of California, and we have, once again, people at the Global Conference from 50 to 60 countries and from most of the states, but as it relates to California that you're currently leading, uh, what would make, what could we do today to make California the world headquarters for precision medicine? Well, what's, you have to do a lot of things. Uh, I think you have, you'd have, the, but we just heard about the collaboration in San Diego, uh, a larger collaboration of the state government, uh, the, pub, uh, the public universities, the private universities, uh, a focused initiative, uh, making the proper investments, um, convening the, the knowledgeable people and then uh, linking up with all the groups that focus on specific diseases and bringing the consumer uh, as well as the other key um, relevant personalities in, in the medical world. I, th I think just like stem cell is, uh, is an analogy uh, that started uh, with, with a vision that California would go its own way separate from the federal government. And we've done that. And now California, I think, is quite a leader in stem cell uh, research and successes. So th I think that's the path that we, we, we would look to. Well, we're going to look for your leadership. I would hope we could see today that medicine as we know it, how we treat patients in the future is going to dramatically change. It has the tremendous potential of reducing cost and also increasing both the length and quality of life. And I want to thank each of you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.